How about now? Yeah, okay, it works fine. Okay, um, thank, uh, thank you for organizing this and thank you everyone for coming to this talk. Um, and hopefully you can see my video that I'm wearing this original chisel conference shirt with this, um, I don't know, very beautiful orange color. Um, all right, so hi, my name is Jack Koenig and I'm going to be talking, uh, this talk is titled Chisel Breakdown 3. And what is this talk really? This is a talk, not so much for users of Chisel, but for current and potential developers of Chisel. So this is about the current implementation of Chisel version 3.5.4 for anyone watching this in the future. And most of this is not stuff that users need to know. Hopefully some of it's still interesting and useful, but this is primarily geared toward people who want to enhance Chisel itself, add features. And um, Kevin did talk a lot about extending it. And so if there's anyone interested in doing that sort of thing, this is a good talk for you. The primary focus in this talks on the weird stuff. So Chisel has a lot going on in it. A lot of it is good code and some of it is very strange code. And so I'm trying to focus on things that are weird here, the things that you need to know when you're developing. This does assume a moderate knowledge of using Chisel and Scala. Um, so this is not necessarily for people who are brand new, but maybe people have used Chisel a little bit and want to develop it. I apologize for jumping around a bit because um, there's a lot to cover and I only have so much time. And um, Yes, I will note that this is not a Chisel update. If you want to know what's new in Chisel, please see my, my talk at the previous Chips Alliance workshop back in maybe April, and then there should be another one in the next couple months for the next update. Okay, so what is Chisel? And actually, I want to you know give another shout out here to Kevin, who did a great job of, of giving an example of how you use Chisel. Um, how I usually talk about it, you know, not using examples, is just that it's a hardware construction language embedded in Scala. <clears throat> I'll focus that it is not high-level synthesis. We are not converting Scala into Verilog by translating or compiling the Scala itself. Um, rather, what Chisel is, is it's a library embedded in Scala. And when you, when you run the program that you created in Scala, the execution of that program constructs a hardware graph that will emit um, into ultimately into Verilog. Um, Chisel is a domain-specific language for digital design. Similarly to Verilog is a domain-specific language for digital design. Um, kind of a subtle point about Chisel is that, you know, it is a generator framework. It's not the only one that's ever existed. But one important thing is that many other generator frameworks tend to be, you know, you kind of construct Scal or you construct Verilog strings and then emit it at the end. Chisel instead is a language with its own semantics. And so it, it has, this, it has, you know, as Kevin mentioned, it has more, um, a bit more of its own, you know, checks and things to help make sure you don't make mistakes and prevent you from running into errors in the animated Verilog. Now, the most important thing about Chisel, and I think Jerry illustrated this really well, is that Chisel is a platform upon which to build higher level abstractions. And that's, I think, the, uh, the knock generator he was talking about is a great example of that. Okay, that's what Chisel is when I'm talking to users, but what is Chisel really? Like I said, it's a library of Scala objects and classes mm -hmm. representing hardware. It has types um, like UNS that bundle, it has hardware binding operators, things to construct pieces of hardware like reg, wire, IO, MUX, and MIM. It has structure, things like constructing a module it itself technically isn't hardware, but it's an organizational structure. And WIN is a similar way of behaviorally describing conditional semantics like a MUX, but is itself kind of organization. Chisel is a hardware graph. It has its own internal intermediate representation, Chisel IR. This is not to be confused with Turtle or Fertile, which do get emitted later. Internally, it has its own IR. Um, and Chisel is a bunch of functions that construct IR nodes. These functions importantly mutate global data structures. And if you really want to understand the crux of how Chisel works, understanding that every function call, or most of them at least, are mutating global data structures is the key insight and everything that falls out of that. Uh, Chisel IR is then emitted into Turtle, which is a, you know, a, a version of Fertile that has a few extra features. Um, Chisel also nowadays is a Scala compiler plugin, which extends you know, Scala slightly to add some features like our naming plugin, auto clone type, uh, bundled element generation, which is brand new in Chisel 3.5.1. So it did not exist at the previous time I gave this talk uh, last year. And uh, Chisel is a lean front end on Fertile. So Chisel is not the entire compiler. Chisel does not emit Verilog. Chisel emits Fertile and then Fertile emits Verilog. Um, that distinction doesn't matter for most users, but it definitely matters for developers. Okay, so how does Chisel really work? And let's see if I can uh, have a, well, that's not what I want. Anyway, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, I think there's a way to turn it into a pointer. Whatever. Um, sorry, going back. I cannot go back. What's happening? Why can't I go back? Sorry, give me one minute. Let me reshare. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so how does Chisel, like what does the Chisel flow really look like? So you have your Scala code, you run Scala compilation, which has that plugin I mentioned, but for the most part, Scala compilation is just the Scala compiler and your build tool like SBT or MIL. That generates Java bytecode. Okay, there is no fertile or Verilog yet, right? First, you've just done Scala compilation. Then you have this Java bytecode, which is a, you know, you can run on the JVM, right? This is an executable program. And when you run that generator, what gets emitted is this elaborated circuit in fertile.fir. You run a fertile compiler on that fertile and out you get Verilog. So for most users, you may see the Scala compile in the running and then fertile kind of will, may run along with that to give you Verilog. But what's really important here, as I keep, I will keep reiterating, is that we're not converting Scala to Verilog. What we're doing is we're building a program. And when you run that program, Verilog comes out. Okay, on to the next slide. So where can errors be caught in this flow? Uh, I have marked in green here, places we like catching errors. Red is not good places, and then there are some others. But Scala compilation, where, for example, you can't call plus on a bundle because bundles don't have addition defined. You need to use a uint or an essent. Um, but some errors are caught at chisel during chisel elaboration. This is when we're running the Scala program. And these are cases of binding exceptions, which I'll talk about in a bit. Bad connections, you know, you connect types that are not the same. That's actually caught at runtime. Then comes fertile compilation. Some errors we can't check in chisel and they're caught in fertile, like initialization, which means you didn't connect something under all circumstances, combinational loop detection. Sometimes when there's a bug in chisel or fertile, you may get an error in your parallel compilation, but this should never happen. We usually and pretty much always in the valid Verilog and you shouldn't be running into issues with that Verilog. And then of course, sometimes you may have logical errors that you can only catch a simulation. Obviously there's nothing Chisel can do about you accidentally putting an and when you meant or. So sometimes the bug will just be a logical error. So let me walk through a simple example of how Chisel elaboration works to really drive home the point I'm trying to make about how it works. So here you see this, um, Kevin had a similar example, a bit more complicated, and you see you have a wire and you have some bitwise and of that wire. Um, you may think that, you know, we can like just look at this Scala code and emit um, Verilog from it, but what actually happens is that each of these calls here, this 8.w, this uint, this wire, this and, and this connect, these are functions that are called in chisel. This val equals is a Scala construct. Chisel actually doesn't know anything about it. This is, you know, the fact that this is assigned to a value is not something that Chisel understands. I'll talk about how we get that name later, but fundamentally all Chisel can see are these function calls. So what happens is you create this wire and that I mentioned these global mutable data structures, it pushes this IR node. When this function is called, it pushes this to a list basically, or a, a running list of things that are happening. The next function call is this and, which pushes a, a def prim op using, doing bitwise addition between foo and bar. And it assigns some default name to the result of that. Notice not wire, it just creates some made up name for it. And then finally, we have this connection call, which is a, again, another function call, which creates this connection operator, which then also gets pushed to that global data structure. And so these three different things in Chisel IR are called commands. Those are kind of like statements in Chisel IR and they're stored inside the containing module, which is called a component in Chisel IR. And so what I'm really trying to underscore here is that these are function calls that push, that construct objects in a global mutable data structure. We're not translating the Scala. We're actually, as the program runs, seeing that you called certain functions. Okay, I mentioned binding. So what is binding? So Scala has a type system, but Chisel, because it has a runtime, has its own type system that only exists at runtime, which we usually refer to as elaboration time. Now, something that can be very confusing is that the Scala type and the Chisel type of some Chisel hardware value are the same, uh, of a Chisel hardware value, and a chisel type are the same. So what do I mean by that? Here, we're constructing an 8-bit UIN. This 8-bit UIN is just a type template, if you will. This is not a hardware value. It does not correspond to a wire or a register. If you want a wire of that type, you have to pass that object to the wire um, you know, um, binding operator, the thing that will construct the wire. Now, from Scala's perspective, these both have the same type. But from chisel's perspective, at elaboration time, they do not. And so if you were to ask Scala, what is the class of these two things, you'll see that that's equal. But if you were to try to do a chisel, uh, a chisel connection, or no, sorry, a chisel equality, right? This is constructing a hardware uh, equals check. You would get a binding error. And I accidentally clicked. And so we're on to the next slide. Sorry for jumping ahead because um, I cannot go. Oh, I can go backwards now. Okay. So you can see that 
this attempting to do a triple equals like you would pass to a win, you'll get a binding exception because it's going to say this template is not hardware. It's just a type. Only this wire is a hardware value. So you can't connect, you can't compare this non-hardware value to a hardware value. Okay, on to call by name because this is a sometimes confusing aspect of Chisel that's really important. An error that people will often see is you forgot to wrap your module in module, right? You try to construct a module object and then pass it as an argument to module, but this doesn't work. And how is it that Chisel can tell the difference between you constructing it versus you know constructing it and then passing it versus just constructing it? Because I just told you a minute ago that Chisel can't tell that these are vowels, right? It cannot, it does not know that you're assigning the result of this to a vowel, but somehow we're able to tell when you do it correctly. How does it do it? There's a feature of Scala called call by name. So, you know, this module is an object with an apply method, and that's what this, this function is calling the apply method. And the argument, instead of just being of type T, you know, subtype of base module, we have this arrow here. And what does this arrow mean? This arrow means that we are delaying the execution of the thing you're passing until we refer to this argument. So this new my module, this is constructing an object, it actually doesn't occur yet. This code does not run until here. And so this gives us the ability to do some setup before the object's constructed and some teardown after the object's constructed. And that's really important for ch how Chisel works, because as I've mentioned, there's this global mutable data structure, and Chisel needs to know what the current module is. And so what it has to do is ask to save the, the previous module, um, you know, and then construct the new module, and then pop back to the previous module so that when you call Chisel functions, it knows what module your hardware is associated with. And that's how that works. It's using this um, call by name feature of Scala. All right, so now I'm gonna um, pop over to a slightly different topic, talking about Chisel's project structure, which I'll use to then lead into some of the other things I'm gonna talk about. So Chisel has several directories with things. There's the plugin, which I've alluded to a bit, that runs as part of the Scala compiler. There are macros that we use. There's the core, the bulk of Chisel implementation. So if you are looking to develop Chisel, core is where most of the code you should look at is. There's the Chisel 3, or source main Scala directory. So it's really source. And this is the Chisel 3 project. This is where kind of the main function and some utilities are defined. This is more like user facing code than what's in core. We have our tests and source test Scala. We have docs and docs. We have the new standard library and integration tests. So Kevin mentioned the standard library a bit and integration tests are where, you know, Chisel test is depends on Chisel. So we can't use Chisel test to test Chisel itself, but we have this project of integration tests where we can use Chisel test to do some higher level tests of the internal features of Chisel. Now, why is this three different projects? One important one is that, well, the plugin is part of the, of the plugin or part of the, the Scala compiler, so it has to be a separate project. But in Scala, when you have macros, you can't use them in the same project in which they're defined. So you have to have a different project for your macros. Why are Core and Chisel 3 split? I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so what are our macros that Chisel uses? There's There are a few. Um, the main ones, though, I would say are runtime deprecated, which we use to mark things where at runtime we can print you a warning instead of just at Scala compile time. Um, uh, probably the most important one is the source info transform. Now, despite the name of this, it actually doesn't provide the source locators. That's done using kind of, um, using something that's in core. But what source info transform does is allows us to chain apply after calling the chisel function. I'll give an example of this later. It's very, it's very strange. And you see all these do underscore methods. That's all about the source info transform that I'll talk about later. Another one that's fairly new in the most recent version of chisel actually is this literal bit extract warning. A common problem people run into is they wrote, they write like 3.u8 when they meant 3.u8.w. And the problem is this former one is creating a literal and then doing an immediate bit extract, whereas here you're setting the width to eight. This is obviously a huge problem. People have complained about this for a long time for good reason. And so now there's a macro that can inspect and see that you accidentally did this and it will print a warning. And um, I think we'll soon make this an error, probably in 3.6 or 3.7. But um, you know, now we can actually detect it because of a macro can inspect that you wrote the wrong thing. And the macro is needed to distinguish between this and this. Because again, from Chisel's perspective, all you're doing is calling functions. So how can it know that you called this on a, you know, on a literal accidentally versus um, intentionally? And the way it does it by is by inspecting what you wrote. There's also the range transform used by intervals. I'm gonna gloss over that. And then the Chisel name transform, or sorry, macro, which we used to use to name things in Chisel, but now we have the compiler plugin. So this was actually removed in 3.6 and it's deprecated in 3.5. 
OK, so what's in core? This is where most user-facing classes and objects are. So data, uint, win, wire, module, printf, all of these things are defined in core. It's also where the compile options, uh, macro, and materializer are defined. Um, and it's where most of Chisel's internals are defined, including the builder, which I'll touch on in a minute, the internal IR representation, Chisel IR, and the source info, the actual thing that represents source locators, as opposed to source info transform, which I'll talk about in a minute, source info is the thing that actually does source locators. So why are these two macros, the compile options and the source info macros inside of core? Because as I mentioned, you cannot use a macro in the same compilation unit in which you define it. And so what that means in Chisel that's very useful by having these defined in core is that we don't want to accidentally materialize compile options or source locators in core because we want those to be provided by the user, right? We only want to materialize these inside of user code in your source code. We don't want to give you a source locator pointing to Chisel's internals. That would not be very useful. And so by defining these macros in the core compilation unit, if we accidentally forget to thread the compile options or the source info through, we get a compile error in Chisel. So it's a way of Chisel checking itself and not accidentally you know, giving you bad source locators is kind of what it's trying to do. All right, on to the Chisel 3 build unit, which is source main Scala Chisel 3. And here's where Chisel stage is, which is kind of the main way of invoking the Chisel compiler or invoking Chisel and building custom compiler flows. It's where compatibility.scala lives, which is if you've ever seen import capital C Chisel, like in Rocket Chip, this is the compatibility mode for Chisel 2 style semantics. It's all defined in there. Um, it's where we have utilities like decoupled Q Arbiter, and there's the aspects oriented programming library, which I don't think I'll have time to cover today, but I've discussed in previous talks, and you can um, take a look at the code to see how, how that works. Okay. And then finally, you know, there's the plugin, as I mentioned, this is the Scala C compiler plugin. It runs as part of Scala compilation, and it has two pieces, the Chisel component. These components are the term used in the Scala compiler for um, basically compiler passes. So there's the Chisel component, which is used to name signals, and the bundle component, which is used to generate clone type and elements for bundles to make it to where we don't have to rely on Java runtime reflection anymore for these two uh, features. Um, and then we have the docs directory. This is documentation that works. I, I think we're pretty proud of how this works because um, the docs has sourced and generated. And so it's actually uses this library called mdoc and you write markdown with some extra like little annotations where it takes that markdown that you wrote and it compiles the Scala examples and runs them to make sure that they work. And so this allows us to have our code examples actually always be up to date with Chisel because if Chisel changes, it's regenerated every time we publish a new version of Chisel. And so a good example of this is the, the bundle literals documentation. On the right here, I have what the, this is the markdown file. And you'll see here, it's, you know, uses Scala, but it mentions mdoc, which will tell the tool, mdoc tool to compile this code. And then down here, we have Scala mdoc colon Verilog. And this is what this does is it actually runs the Scala code, gets Verilog, and then wraps it in, you know, Verilog so that on the left side, which is what's on the website, you can see the exact Scala source code, except it's been compiled to check that it works. And then the Verilog that's generated by it. And this is correct because it was generated from this exact code. Um, so this is pretty cool. And if, if you're interested in contributing to Chisel or if you notice our documentation is not good, this is a great place to look because you can help improve it and make documentation that is always up to date, which is pretty exciting. OK, so I mentioned Chisel stage a bit. This is the main user-facing API for invoking Chisel. It's how you run the generator. Um, you know, you have your module that you've defined, but you need to call Chisel Stage to build it so that we can, you know, do all of our setup and stuff for the Chisel runtime. This is how what Chisel main dot main calls uh, Chisel Stage, the command line interface. This has lots of utilities for creating, you know, for generating various levels of compilation. You can generate Turtle or Fertile. You can also generate Verilog, which means it will also run a, you know, run the Scala Fertile compiler to emit Verilog in the same JVM run, as opposed to serializing and then running it separately. Um, I'll note that there is a distinction between class chisel stage and object chisel stage that isn't super clear. Um, and so we're in the future, we're kind of improving this distinction, but this still does exist where the class version is used for writing files. So if you want to invoke chisel and you want it to write a dot fur or a dot v file, you use the class. The object does not write files. It's used for you know, running Chisel and just printing to the, to the you know, console, which is useful for 
examples and testing, but isn't if you're trying to you know build a Verilog artifact that you're going to put on an FPGA, for example. There is now a simplified API that does not directly use chisel stage, just chisel 3.get Verilog string for getting a Verilog string and not emitting a file, and chisel 3.emit Verilog, which will emit a file. So I think we're going to move toward the, the simplified APIs to make it more clear, but chisel stage is important for developers to know about. Okay, the builder, as I mentioned, is kind of Chisel's internal runtime. If you look in the internals of Chisel, you'll see builder dot whatever all over the place because that's kind of like how Chisel, uh, you know, records its own, like how it records information about what's happening. It is also the entry point into Chisel elaboration. So the builder, when you invoke Chisel via Chisel stage, it will call the builder, which then does all the setup needed for the chisel runtime, which includes two things called the dynamic context and the chisel context. Um, don't worry too much about the distinction between these two, but note that these are the objects that contain all the global mutable state that chisel uses during elaboration. These are wrapped in Scala util dynamic variables. And what that does is it makes this global state thread local. So, you know, global mutable state is scary. Uh, it makes it really hard to, you know, invoke the same code twice. But what is useful about making this thread local is that you can invoke multiple single threaded invocations of chisel elaboration in the same JVM. It's just that within one elaboration, all the state is thread local, or all the, all the state is global to the thread of your elaboration. And as I mentioned, the builder is what all mutations to that global state go through. So anytime you create a module, it pushes, it sets the current module to point to your module. Anytime you do something that constructs hard, hardware, it pushes an op. And then of course, if there are errors, these are how they were reported. Okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Okay, so compile options are how we implement the compatibility mode stuff that I mentioned earlier, and that you may see if you see import capital C chisel. And essentially, these are objects that have some options that change the behavior of various chisel function calls. These are passed implicitly. Um, I will say that this is going away. This is finally to be deprecated in chisel 3.6. So, you know, rocket chip and other projects will be changing to stop using this. So soon this will no longer be relevant, but it is relevant for developers today. You need to know that these compile options that are getting threaded through change the semantics of various function calls. And that's why they're there. Um, okay. I mentioned source locators a bit. So there's the source info transform defined in macros and source info, which is defined in core. And as I mentioned, source info is actually the thing that records the source locator. So what is this all about? So basically all the source info transform does is anytime you see something called, you know, invoking, you know, that's implemented by using this macro call, what the macro does is anytime the user calls this function in their code, it replaces it with do underscore, do underscore the name of the function. So why do we do that? What is the purpose of that? The purpose is that the user wants to be able to call that function and then immediately do a bit extract. So here's a bitwise and. This one's Boolean and, but I'm actually calling a bitwise and on uns here. And then I want to extract bit number five, right? If we didn't do this macro and we only had the version that had the implicit arguments, Chisel or Scala wouldn't let you do this because it would see this five and think you're trying to pass an argument for the source info. And it would say you got the wrong type. So what the macro does is it lets you call it just on this version, and then it will go in and inject the do underscore and grab your source info and your compile options for you. And then your little five argument is still there afterward being called. And so literally all that the source info transform is for is allowing you to chain your bit extract after your operation. Yes, it is a lot of code and a lot of influence on the internals to make that happen, but you know we're really focused on trying to make the user API as good as we can. So that's what source info transform is all about and what all the do underscore stuff you see is about. Okay, the Chisel naming plugin is how we are able to provide good names. So I mentioned earlier that Chisel doesn't actually know about fouls, right? Chisel is a runtime and you call functions, you call uint, input, IO. It doesn't know that you're assigning it to a vowel. Um, so I said Chisel doesn't know about vowels. That's only partially true because the Chisel plugin does know about vowels. And what it does is it inserts extra function calls to give the Chisel runtime hints about what the names of your signals are. And so how does this work? Say we have this function, right? You know, we're adding A and B, we're subtracting three, we're bitwise anding it, and then we're oring it and, you know, assigning that to a vowel and then connecting that to a result. And if you run Chisel today, you'll see you get result underscore X, result underscore Y for these two signals prefixed by this result because the function is called and returned to this value, we're able to prefix it such that if you were to call this function with a different value, you'd get a different prefix. So it allows kind of scoping of the names based on your call stack, which is pretty cool and makes the Verilog a bit more stable. 
Um, and so this is what you get with uh, the Scala Proto compiler today. But how does this actually work? What happens is the, the, the compiler plugin is injecting. So your user source code is actually changed by the compiler plugin and it injects two function calls for everything that you write that you assign that's of type data. It will inject auto name recursively with the name of this val and prefix with the name of the val. Could we combine these into one? Probably, but this is how it works today. And so what it's basically saying is prefix anything constructed in the scope with this and then assign the final result this name. Okay. And so that's what happens. And because you have the way the call stack works is you have this prefix result, you get here, it names X, but there's a prefix of results. So it gets named result underscore X, same for Y. Um, and then this val gets named result. You didn't see it in the Verilog because it, it, it uh, result is immediately connected to out. And so the result signal got removed because it was just connected directly out. But anyway, the point is that the compiler plugin injects these function calls that give the chisel runtime access to the name that was used in the Scala. But what happens if there's multiple possible names, right? What happens if I create, you know, I have this little inner scope, I assign, I construct a wire, assign it to a value bar, I connect it, I return that value to an, you know, so the outer name of the same wire, right? Boo and bar refer to the exact same object. And then I do an alias here, valphys equals foo, right? So there's three possible names I could give this, foo, bar, and fizz. Now, intuitively, the best name for this is the first name in the outermost scope, right? So foo, like bar was a name only for this internal scope, right? This is a function and bar is not accessible outside this lexical scope. So outside of this function, it's called foo. So foo is the real name of this signal and fizz is not, right? Foo was the first name. So we give it the name foo, not fizz. So how do we do that though? I keep reiterating that chisel doesn't actually know um, you know, yes, it gives little name hints about these, but it can't really distinguish between foo and fizz that well. So how are we able to do it? That nice little feature I mentioned earlier called by name parameters. So what happens in, in the chisel runtime, every, every object that gets created has an ID. And this auto name recursively function that's getting injected by the compiler plugin is uh, called by name. So what that means is that when auto name recursively is injected here, this little um, function inside of here, where we're you know doing all this stuff in here, does not happen immediately. What happens is first we get the current ID from the builder, then we invoke this function that you the user wrote, and then with the object returned, we check is its ID greater than the current ID. Right, so if if the ID of the object returned is greater than what the ID was before you call that function, that means the object was created in the scope of that function, which means we should name it. And so what that allows us to do is when you then pass foo to this auto name recursively, foo already exists. It already has an ID. Its name is you know the current ID. So when you then call this one, and you check what is the current ID. Uh, and then you you know invoke foo, you'll see that foo is not the, the the this return value is not greater than the current ID. And so we don't name it. And so that allows us to have, you know, we want foo to win over bar. So bar is the first name, and then that value gets returned again, and it's still the signal is new from the perspective of this outer scope. And so we name it. But then we pass it to here and it's not new anymore. And so the name fizz does not apply. And so that's how naming works, which I think is pretty slick and allows us to give fairly intuitive names um, based on the structure of the, the user's code. Okay, so I also mentioned that the compiler plugin implements clone type. What is clone type? Because chisel types are immutable, are immutable objects, right? I can construct this type object and then pass it to an IO and a wire. And you know, therefore, this one object here, Gen, I need to create fresh instances of the same type for IO and W. Right, so I need the ability to create clones of gen, and we need the ability to be the ability to create clones of any data object. And so this is an important implementation detail for you, the developer watching this talk. Um, all the internal types in Chisel that are sealed, so therefore not user extensible like uint and vec, have their own implementation. But the problem is user defined types like bundles and records need to have a clone type implemented to construct the right object. It's very formulaic code. In old chisel, you will have seen stuff like this a lot, where you have some class bundle and then override def clone type, blah, 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 construct this object with the same parameter. It's super formulaic. And so the compiler plugin is able to do this automatically. 
It replaces an older version that has I have extra slides for, and you can see in past talks, but they're no longer relevant because as of Chisel 3.5, the, the plugin version of Auto Clone Type is always turned on, and there's no you're not allowed to write Clone Type yourself anymore. So that's pretty nice for users. Um, and the code for this is in the compiler plugin. But how does it actually work? The compiler plugin, you know, doing all that auto name recursively injection is also injecting two functions for every bundle. It injects clone type impl, where it will inject the implementation of calling, you know, of, of constructing a new object of the same type with the same arguments. And it also marks that you're using the plugin. Now, this is now required. So every bundle will have this overridden in it. And then in bundle itself, the abstract class, right? This is extending an abstract class. The implementation of clone type just calls this version that was generated by the plugin um, and then casts it. And so that's basically how clone type works. Um, the plugin is able to inspect the class that you have, uh, you know, generate a function calling the constructor with the right arguments. We're doing something similar now for elements. Um, so bundles have elements which are correspond to the public fields of the class. This is brand new in 3.5.1, and it will be just like clone type became mandatory, it will be mandatory in 3.6. But I urge users to en enable it with the Scala C plugin. We couldn't turn it on by default for, for binary compatibility reasons, but for most users, you should definitely enable it. It results in a 20 to 30 percent speed up. So this is a great addition. So if you're wondering why we did this, it's for the performance speed up instead of using runtime reflection. And this is very similar to what I just showed you for clone type. So the plugin injects one more method, this elements impl which is an iterable of the name and object value for every public field of the class, every public data field of the class. And so this just you know, constructs a vector that has um, you know, this field, um, the name, the string name, pointing to the actual like this dot field value. And that's all that is. Um, the, similarly to how for clone type, it calls the implementation and it does some stuff inside of uh, abstract class bundle, there's this object, this lazy about elements, which is calling that function and then iterating all the elements to construct the internal representation. Because fundamentally, internally, all bundles are is a map of the names of the fields to the actual data values. Um, that's how they're implemented internally. And so now the plugin can generate them. And so, you know, I only have 30 minutes. And so I'm going to stop it here, even though I'm a little bit over. Sorry about that. Um, and I will answer any questions I can in the chat. So thank you very much. Hopefully that was.